Okay. The campuses are in linear? Yes, they're Online. Good morning. So this is the last unit we have this week. Welcome, please come in. Good morning. Hello. Okay, yesterday afternoon we compiled a sociohydrological model, which is sort of here on the table. Uh, I have one tiny thing to add to the model, just for you to, to remember. Of course, this is, would not be a final model. You would have got those these iterations again and again until you're happy. But one thing we have not discussed, and uh, maybe just to, for you to, uh, to alert you, um, this Q variable, we have only one input. One input is the population density of the entire catchment, big P. But maybe we should also have an input of the rainfall. Because it depends how you, we set up the model. But if we want to have it a dynamic model, so we would have a time step of a year, for example, or, or of days even. It really doesn't matter so much what the time step is. It's more a numerical question. So we have one value for each year, and then the trace of the damage and the, and the change in the, oh, in, the, in, the, in the money, the G. So if you want to have that, we want to have big and small floods in different years, right? A sequence of floods, like in the, the model I showed you on the screen from Germany, right? You have bigger floods, smaller floods, bigger floods, and we don't have this in the model, right? So if it's one possibility if you follow the route of a stochastic input, meaning you could generate flood magnitudes every year, right? Uh, and you could do this by uh, using precipitation as a random number as an input. It's very simple. Just add a very, very little, little equation here. So when we have, um, where is it, Q. Um, mean annual flood discharge. So when, uh, where's the damage? Here, right? No, DP. Where's the damage? W here, right? This is the damage. So B is a coefficient, W is the water level. And now the water level is made a function of the mean annual discharge. So you would have, if you just use it as it is, in every year, the water level would be the mean annual flood, which would probably not uh, just be bank full. Well, I've been told you have inundations every two years, so bank full is the mean annual discharge. The mean annual discharge is usually a two-year flood, a 2.2-year .2 flood, right? So what you can do, you can just add to the, this equation for the water level, we have blue, blue, a blue pen. Um, actually, we do have blue and black pens. Yeah, maybe. So we can simply add to this component where we, thank you very much, appreciate this. To this component where we estimate the water level, F3 is where we add the water level as a function of the mean annual flood and the cross sectional area, which should actually be B, right? as we said yesterday, we just add precipitation, which would be external. <coughs> and it's a random variable. A random variable means, what is a random variable? What is a random variable? You understand the question? Okay, anybody knows the answer? No? Okay, you know what a dice is. A dice is like a cube with points on the ends. It's a dice. And um, dados, dado, what? Dados, right? Okay, Spanish is dados, right? The dice. I roll the dice and then I look at the numbers at the top. Three, for example. I roll again, two. I roll again, two. Roll again, six, it's a dice. And the numbers that come out from the dice can be considered a random number. It varies. You cannot predict it exactly. If I roll the dice again, 
I hide it, what is it? We don't know. But we know the probability of a certain number to appear. And the probability is one sixth for a dice, because there are six sides and it's symmetric. The probability that three will appear is one sixth, 0.167, right? okay? We know the probability, we don't know the number. Still good. Knowing the number is better. It would be very good for get, play, get, playing games to know the number we don't, but we know the probability, which is still okay. And a random number is exactly that. So I know the probability that a certain rainfall is exceeded in the year, which gives us a histogram or a probability distribution. These are the probabilities. And we can put this as an input and say the probability that the rainfall of, of maybe 100 millimeters is exceeded in one hour is 0.001, one, one, one over a thousand, for example. This is the probability we can put into this model, and then we can draw a random number using a computer, which is the same as a dice, but using a program. Even in Excel, you can draw random numbers, and certainly in R and in, in, in uh, Python and, and the other program languages, you have a function that says random number, and bang, it comes up with lots of random numbers. And then you put it into the software, and then each year you get a different rainfall, and from the rainfall you calculate the water level and the and from the mean annual flood. Okay, it's one addition to the, to the, yes, very good to the. And you can take another photo if you want it yes. before I remove this. Okay, now we have finished with these seven steps, and we have a model. And I would not, like to achieve two things today. I would like to put the stylized model, we call this a stylized, very simple model. There are only 14 parameters and only four variables, I think, or five, four or five variables, so it's a rather simple model. And it's spatially lumped. Spatially lump means, lumped means, lump means to put together, right? Lumping. Lump means the opposite of spatially distributed. A distributed model is a map. So you have a map of the area, and you simulate, for example, the water levels in different parts on the map. In hydraulics, we do this based on the shallow water equation, or Savinot equation, which is uh, momentum balance and what's the second part of the Savinot equation? Anybody had hydraulics? Civil engineers, environmental engineers? So two parts, one is momentum equation, the other is mass mass equation, mass balance, momentum balance, balance, mass balance, that's the Savinot equation or shallow water equation. With that we can simulate the spatial distribution of the water as if it were a, like an aerial photograph. With this model we cannot do that. It still would be good to have a spatial distribution of where the shops are and where they get inundated, right? So, so the, the, the first thing I want to do is the complexity, discuss the complexity of the model. Simple models, more complex models, and what it means for the application. One first thing. And the second thing I want to achieve today is um, application of social hydrological models for water management. Because ultimately, of course, we're interested in research, but ultimately, we're also interested in, that, in helping society, making the world a better place. And meaning not just doing here, having fun with equations, but also applying them in the way that the water resources are, matched, are managed more efficiently. Okay? These two things I would like to achieve. And I'm starting with the first one, with the complexity. The, the social hydrological models, the specific characteristics is that we have water and people, and one aspect. The other aspect is we have feedbacks. Okay? Feedbacks as in this causal loop diagram. We have um, where are the feedbacks, for example. Uh, the water level affects D, density, and D affects the area, and the area affects the water level, right? So there is a feedback loop here. This affects this, and this affects this, the error, and this affects this, and this is this. This is called a feedback effect, feedback. And feedbacks produce interesting dynamics, and including emerging dynamics, those that are not so obvious that they, they, emerge, like, uh, that they occur, like Romeo and Juliet. If these two differential equations produce an uh, oscillating signal, this is not what we would expect, right, by looking at the equations. It's emerging dynamics. Okay, 
feedbacks, exactly. This, these are also feedback loops. Um, and now they are representing feedbacks can be done by different model complexities. Different model complexities. Complexity means uh, how many parameters we have in a model. How many, how, how non-linear the model is. A linear regression, as we had here, this is a linear regression. Y, the output is alpha, which is the parameter. X is the input. This is a complex model or a simple model? Very simple model, right? One parameter only, one parameter only, and it's linear. Super, super simple, right? Now, feedbacks can be, as I said, can be represented in different levels of complexity. And I would like to give you now an, an example of the uh, demand supply curves in economy. I talked about that to one of the students. Is she here today? Demand supply. You were that. Yes, we did. Would you be willing just to explain what I explained to you yesterday? I'll, I'll help, right? I, I know it's a little difficult. No, but come forward, please. Okay. I, I will help because it is a little difficult. But, and also you help me, okay? okay. Is this a deal? Okay, I, I will try. Okay, we will try. And I'll, I'll start with the diagram. I think this diagram looks like that. Is this correct? Yes, and there's another one. Okay. Okay, you remember the diagram. Very good. Yes. So try to explain where the feedback comes in. And, and what well, the if I produce a lot of a product, like example, a shoe. Let me say I produce a lot of shoes, then I will have a lot of quantity and the price goes down. And I have to try to have an equilibrium of quantity and price. And I, I don't know what else. So if I produce... Um, Can you, uh, Mar Mar uh, Maria? Gabriel. Gabriel, sorry, Gabriel. Um, can you maybe put it into context? What, what, who came up with this diagram and in what context is it used? It is using economies. Yes. And economies use this diagram, so you can add elasticity to this. And I think that's all I remember. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. I tried to expand on that. I think you made a very good start. Economic th economics, they deal with people. Right? And they're not concerned with putting people into numbers, with how much they buy and what they're willing to pay for their goods. And this is one of the classic diagrams that I think was invented at the end of the 19th century. And it has to do with the comparison of supply, how much companies produce of shoes, as you were saying, and at what price. And um, on the one hand, supply, how much do the companies produce? The producers, right, the industry. And the consumers, which is us, the consumers, how many shoes we buy and at what price? And then if how much they produce and how much we buy is the same, then it is at an equilibrium. This is called market equilibrium. And this is in the section of these two points. But I will explain these two curves because it's not at all intuitive. I, I myself, I find it very difficult to understand because it's plotted in a way it should not be plotted, actually. But historically, it's the way uh, they, they, they did it um, 100 years ago. So what it means? The supply is the companies. Uh, so horizontal axis is the price of the good, how much the shoes cost, right? And Quantity is how many shoes, okay? Now, 
you need to read this diagram as this, as the independent variable, and this is the dependent variable. Oh, the other way around, no. This is the independent variable, this is the dependent variable. Usually on the vertical axis you have the dependent variable, on the horizontal axis the independent variable. But this is the other way around, right? So whoever invented that was not, <laughs> not very useful for us. So I need to, I'm pointing that out, right? So for a given price, what is the quantity? This is the way to read it. Okay, for the supply, producers of shoes, if the price is very high, if you've got a lot of money for your shoes to be produced, you will produce lots of shoes, right? Of course, I will do all that I can just to produce shoes because I get a lot of money for them. So as the price goes up, the money, the quantity produced will increase. That's why this curve goes up. Okay? Now, as consumers, how many shoes will we buy? This will depend on how much they cost. So, as the price in decreases, if they're cheaper, the quantity we buy increases. If there is a bargain, I buy more shoes. This is the, how to interpret these two diagrams. I mean, you already said it, slightly different words. And if it's the intersection, is the equilibrium. Okay, so this is like standard uh, economic theory. And of course, the market is never at an, at an equilibrium, but it's, it's, it's almost dynamic. Now, I want, want to use this diagram to explain the, the simplest possible way to represent a feedback, right? Now, if I changed one of the curves, if I changed um, this curve, okay, this dotted line means production at cheaper costs. I invented a new method of producing shoes a new machine. I can produce shoes more cheaply than I could before. Okay? So the dotted line will be lower. I can produce the same quantity for a lower price. Now, in the, in the equilibrium theory, what will happen? What will happen is that people will buy more shoes. So the new intersection is here. Here, yeah, right? But not this exact same quantity, or the, the increase, the increase in how much, how many shoes they buy is not proportional to the reduction in the, in the cost. Because they're, because of the, uh, as the quantity changes, as the cost changes, they will buy more shoes, but not to the same effect, because they will say, well, the, 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 the cost of the shoe has changed. Also, the quantity we, we, we buy has changed. And this is a feedback, that, which is, this feedback is called elasticity, right? We also had another example. Do you remember the elasticity example about people? Uh, there was a people example, I think, we, we discussed yesterday. Like people here about, uh, do you remember that? Uh, some, some social. Uh, what's some social example about, uh, was it about uh, going out for dinner or something? No, it was not about shoes. About why it was yes, but we had another example. We had something like a family example or something. I, I forget. Anyway, good. So the idea is that this, these two curves represent feedbacks in a simplified way. Okay, if there were no feedbacks, if we just, if we just reduce the price, this is the new equilibrium. If we only reduce the price without the effect, so this is the previous intersection, without the effect of the feedbacks, then uh, for the same price, you, you would be here. The price would not change. But there's this, this other point right here on the horizontal line. But because of the feedback, the, 
the consumers respond to the change in the price, and this is a feedback. And this is done in an implicit way, this feedback. Okay? It's not fully clear, is it? Is it clear to you why this is a feedback? No, it's not, is it? It's not clear, no. Um, we did have another example that was somehow clearer. Gabriel, it was an example. Yeah, yeah, we had one. I thought it was a very good example, but it just I came up with it and I forget. No, no, it was not wife and husband. It was not Romeo and Juliet. No, it was. Um, um, ah, I remember. I remember. It was a classroom example. No, you will remember in a, in a second. OK. I'm very strict with my examinations at my universities. Yes? I'm very strict. So if you want to pass my examinations, you need to get 60% of the answers right. OK? It's tough. Hydrology is a tough subject. So some people fail. Some people are pass the examination. And, and they know. This is a tough examination, so they study very hard. But then, you no, know, I'm, I'm getting old, so I'm milder. So I think maybe I'm too strict. Let's reduce 60% to 40%. OK? And then what will happen? Without feedbacks, without feedbacks, what will happen is that because the limit is lower, there will just more students pass the examination without feedback. But students are clever. And then the first time, the first cohort of students, many more will pass. But in the second examination, you talk to each other, also to the other semesters. You will say, hey, this examination has become much easier. We don't have to study so hard. We can study less. So you start study less. Then what will happen? I'm still, I, I'm, I'm still at 40%, but not as many students will pass as in the first examination, because you have learned less. That's a feedback. Right? You understand? There's a feedback. And this is exactly this feedback with the shoes, right? Here. I mean, shoes is a little more difficult to understand. But with this, these two curves, we can represent a very simple feedback without a dynamic model. Right? You understand that? And this is the elasticity. And the elasticity is a variable that tells us when you see that the examination is becoming easier, how much less do you study? If the elasticity is zero, you study the same. If the elasticity is 100%, you're very opportunistic, you study much less. And the same number of students will pass as before. OK? It's called elasticity. So the simplest way of representing feedbacks is just by an index without any time dynamics by this kind of elasticity. Okay? Now, I'm glad we had this discussion yesterday yeah. afternoon because I think the classroom example is easier to understand than the economic one. But the idea is exactly the same. Okay? Very good. So this is the simplest way of representing feedbacks, including in sociohydrology, of course. And you can think of similar curves in a sociohydrological context. So number one, simplest feedbacks without time dynamics, just implicit through, simplicity, through, through elasticity. Second level of complexity are stylized models. Stylized, do we have a word for stylized models? Stylized, I can write it down. Stylized. Stylized. Sty is an S. Stylized models. And what we developed yesterday is a stylized model. It does not represent all the complexity a water manager would like to see in the model. Now, I'm not sure who is managing the water resources in this city, but they usually have a map of the area because they need to make a decision. Do we grant this, this billing permit or we don't? So without a map, it's really very difficult for the water managers or, or land managers. This is not complex enough for this 
daily work of water and land managers. It's a stylized model. And the purpose of the stylized model is to, is to understand the lumped dynamics of the system, which a map cannot. The map is just static. You have the system in a lumped way. So the role of stylized models is not direct decision making. It's not a direct decision making tool, but it's a tool at a higher level, like a, a meter level, to understand what's going on. And then when you do your detailed maps, you can indeed take this understanding who is affecting whom to help, make, help in the decision process, or generally in the political process. So a stylized model is more at a meter level, not direct for decision making, but for helping understand the system. It's a stylized model. And we have this diagram here. Uh, can you just uh, go up with this light, uh, light brown diagram? I think it's further in the bottom, actually. At the bottom. Ah, here. So the, what we did in the yesterday is the stylized models, and here are the seven, here are the seven steps we, we discussed, right? Starting with the phenomena and, and in an iterative way. And the alternative, the more complex alternative uh, of stylized models are distributed models, or some people call it system of system models. So there is a complex hydrological model where you have the spatial distribution or a, a hydraulic model based on the shallow water equation with a grid resolution of 10 meters maybe for the, centra, for the center of Sao Carlos. And then you have an economic model, which is much more complex than the one equation we have here. There are these models around. And then you have a fast computer and link everything together and you can make simulations. Okay. And then you can simulate similar things we did, or we can do with the stylized model, but with spatial detail and with much more process understanding that goes into it. Okay? So what do you think? What is better? The, the, with three alternatives. One is the elasticity, one index. Second is a stylized model. Third, complex system, comprehensive system of system model, the, the bottom one. What is better? And why? You understand the question? Okay. These are, these are alternatives. Which one would you select? This one, of course. I know. <laughs> this is our model. I would say, I mean, there are lots of different answers to this question, but it depends on the context, what you want. If you want to do an assessment nationwide of all of Brazil of something, or what was it, water security, right? You, you're very well off with an index. That's perfectly adequate, because you have a map and then one index that tells you how, you know, how water secure the area is. Ninisk is a very good approach. When you want to learn something about the system in the classroom, broader thinking, stylized model is very good. When you do decision making, okay, you need special detail. The problem with this, the last model is it's very complex. It does not guarantee that you get plausible results at all. It may take you years to implement it on the computer and then the result are not useful. It can be just plain wrong, actually, because the system dynamics and the limiting behavior we have been discussing here and the ranges, you cannot do this on the complex model. And then you hope if you put all these components together, you get the right results, but usually you don't, because there are all sorts of errors and biases and it's just simplifications. And even if it's more complex, a system of system model does not necessarily give you the best results unless you spend a lot of time and iteration and changes in the model structure. So it's a big effort. And that's why decision-making is often not based on the system of system models. It's based on 
indices usually, right? Or component models, only a hydraulic model and the economic part is not done explicitly with the feedback loops, right? So it's a possibility. And I understand that a professor from uh, Illinois, University of Illinois, will also be teaching in this class, which is Chiming Kai. Chiming Kai, professor from uh, Urbana Champaign, University of Illinois. He's doing system of system models. So you can get a second opinion from him, and he will probably tell you, you should use system of system models, and these stylus models are not useful for anything. You make up your decision, you make up your mind, you have two opinions, and uh, it's good, because we have a plurality of opinions, and it's good that also Jimmy Kai will present his experience with this kind of models. Okay, so these are the three kinds of model complexities. There's an English um, uh, horse racing, horses, a horse racing expression, which says, there are horses for courses. Have you come across that? There are horses for courses. A course is a racing course. For different racing courses, different horses are best. There are horses for courses, and the same is here. For different purposes, different models are best. Okay, questions? Okay, if not, we move on to, to the applications. Um, so we have a section why, how could you can use them. And, ah, briefly, maybe you go up again to the causal loop diagram because I have not mentioned that. One uh, further up, actually, to the, the flat, two, two uh, figures up, please. Thank you. I have not mentioned that, but I should mention that the left one is this kind of model we've been doing. On the right-hand side, it's called an agent-based model, agent, a, uh, ah, it, you see it here, agent-based model, which is a rather more complex model than that, and the idea, it's an interesting idea, the agent-based model. You have agents, an agent is a person, typically. So you have a catchman, each shopkeeper is one little person, right, in, in this game, agent-based model, person, and then you, uh, assign to this person what he or she is doing in the morning. I'm getting up at 8 o'clock, having breakfast, going to my shop. At, uh, at 9 o'clock, I'm at my shop, open my shop, etc. So then, and for each of these actions of this agent, you assign probabilities. You, they usually do it in a probabilistic way. So let's read this down here. This is for a flooding example, I think. In the morning, leave at 8 o'clock, plus minus 15 minutes. Go to school, park, park the car, go to the shop, go to work, home in the evening, school, supermarket, recreation, stay for the night with probabilities. Probabilities 0.1, probabilities 0.9. And we, we assign this to all these little people in this game, to hundreds of them, thousands of them, ten thousands of them. We can also assign rules, these are rules, rules, how they interact. Okay, and then you get these probabilities you, by questionnaires. You can ask the people, at what time do you come, do you come to your shop? Uh, on average at nine o'clock, right? So you assign these probabilities, and also how they interact, these people. And then you press the button you, in the computer, and you allow these 10,000 people to do their daily work, their daily choirs, course. And then you hope that how they interact will also reflect the total outcome of the system. It's a bottom-up approach. It's a bottom-up approach. You hope you assign the individual components and hope when you put them together, the total effect will be realistic. Okay, that's an agent-based model. It's more complex. And it's nice, it's attractive, you have individual people, but the problem is, all, all, there are two problems. One is often the combined result of these people is not what you observed as a combined result because you don't, you don't understand the interactions very well. One problem. The other problem is it's a kind of black box. So in our equation, we say, well, the damage is proportional to the water level, and, and the cumulative, uh, cumulative outcome of the entire catchment is just the cumulative result of 10,000 little people in the computer, and you don't understand really how they interact because there are too many. There are two disadvantages. But there are also advantages, right? There are pros and cons. Okay, 
I wanted to mention this agent-based model, yes? Sorry, what's the difference between this agent-based model and the distributed-based model for what's your resources? I mean, for example, if you want to understand different processes at different points of our, our study case, how can we differ this agent-based model? For example, how people are consuming water? Yes. No? You, yes. I, you know, usually in water resources, the distributed models are not socio models. They're just hydraulic models, groundwater models, hydrologic models. Right? Distributed. Distributed means we have different parameters, different infiltration capacity, in different parts of the catchment, different rainfall. So the water level it differs. That's a distributed model. And without socio. And you can combine this agent based model with distributed model. You're saying not only does he get up at 8 o'clock, he gets up at 8 o'clock in this pixel and then goes to work to the other pixel. It's a bit like a computer game, right? And so you can specialize it. So they are, they are connected. Agent-based models don't have to be special, but they can be special. And it's a bit of, bit of computer game. It's, it's, it's nice. And the work I've been seeing, it's, it's, you get nice pictures, but my reservation of the agent-based models is a bit of a black box. It easily becomes a computer game, which can be nice in itself. Okay, so agent, I wanted to mention agent-based model because it is popular, because it is attra attractive, as you can see. Okay, now let's move on to the applications. And um, to start with, I would like to pick your mind, ask you, in water management, and not just hydrology, but also sanitary engineering and other fields of water management, why would people use models? Or in civil engineering, civil engineers do use models. When you build a concrete bridge, you always have a model a building like this. Okay, why do people use models in engineering? That's my question. And I would like to have a couple of answers, because there are a couple of answers. Okay, who would like to start? Gabriel. Well, I think to understand the behavior of something, for example, in the future, how my catchment will behave in the future? I think this is one. Okay. How will my catchment behave in the future? Very good. Thank you. Because we don't have how to simulate all the situations. We have to build models to understand how uh, think if I change it, how it will be. Because we don't have how to simulate all the things every time. Okay, so we have very, two very good answers. We want to know something about the future. And you're saying if I change something in the, in the catchment, uh, management options, build a dam, or uh, forest a tree, uh, put trees there, what will happen, right? Like, what is the effect of my management activities? That's the second, very good. Uh, my answer is almost the same as hers. Yes. It's like the, to see the effect of some change you make and some things you cannot build, like a bridge. As you said, you cannot build a bridge to see if it works or not. Then you build a model and you see how it, how it, uh, how it responds to some uh, alterations, to some uh, forces, maybe. How, yes. as Gabriela said, how the river responds if, for example, we have a dam and we increase the flow, how the river will respond. We cannot yes. test, just test. So we do models. Okay. More answers? No, it's pretty exhaustive. And yes, please, yes. And also to decide how um, the measures to do, how to do uh, with the response of the model. Yes, very good. I can see you are very good engineers because these are exactly the answers I would expect to get. This is what engineers do and why they need, why, why we need models. Yes, it's very good. And the same in social hydrology. Now, in social hydrology, it's, it is slightly different because our models are not necessarily as accurate as the model of a bridge. When you have like a steel bridge, and you know the properties of the steel very well. You, need, you know the geometry very well. You don't know the loads very well, of course, but the rest you know very well. And then your predictions are really accurate. Uh, when you have um, like a brick, a brick building, masonry made out of bricks, 
an old building, then you don't know the media characteristics very well, and the predictions are not so very good, actually. But for a new building, the predictions are very good. Of the subsurface, like groundwater, okay, we know something about the sub, not very accurate. Hydraulic models, on the other hand, uh, are quite accurate, if we know the geometry well. We don't know the roughness so well. So, but in socio-hydrology, because socio is involved, the predictions are usually not so accurate. Which means that the typical scenario approach, because what you have been saying is a kind of scenario approach, different cases or scenarios and how to size, how thick should be their bridge. Uh, it's an option, but um, what I would recommend is to look at sociological models more at a, a meter level, a, a higher conceptual level, where they can be very useful even if they are, their prediction is not very accurate. So if you wanted to use the model to predict exactly the number of shops in downtown Sao Carlos in 50 years from now, the prediction will probably not be very accurate. I, I'm sure it, you cannot hope to be very accurate because oh, there's po political change in the new government, there are all sorts of things happen that are not in the model, it can still be important. So uh, sociological models are still very useful for practice, but at the higher conceptual level, and I have now in this paper three applications of socio-hydrology that are very useful, so I believe very useful for, uh, for so water management, which we'll discuss now. And I'll be interested in your opinion, what you think about it. Because it is related to the usual engineering or purpose, but it's a little more conceptual. Okay, let us start with the first. And maybe you have... Uh, uh, no, uh, 5.1, I think. Uh, section 5.1. Yes, very good. Facilitating stakeholder participation. And I wonder whether anybody of you who've read the paper would like to comment on that, whether you have some experience yourself and what you think what that is. So, stake, what is a stakeholder? A stake is a stick, right? It's somebody who holds the stick, it's a stake for, literally. So, but not literally, in water management, what is a stakeholder? People interested. Yeah. Yes. People interested in, the, in something, like in, in the people that are interested in the fluids, like the shopkeepers. Yes. Uh, the people that go to shop, they are interested as well. Uh, Law lawmakers like uh, yes. yes the city council yeah very good so it, 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 that's exactly what you're saying right people who are interested in the problem they have a personal interest so do stakeholders have the same interest or often competing interests competing. often competing <laughs> as a rule they have competing interest one group of people fisheries. We want to keep the water clean so we maximize our fish, fish uh, yield. And then the other people, navigation, the opposite, hydropower, agriculture. They want to pollute the groundwater. Well, they don't want to, but they don't mind polluting it. Water supply, we want clean groundwater, the exact opposite, right? So very often the interests are competing in water management. And this is why we need Water governance, where there's a ministry of, I'm not sure, in Brazil, water or environment? Is water part of environment or agriculture in Brazil? Water is part of? It was uh, part of environment, now it's part of agriculture. Ah, it changed, less the new government. It's together, I think. Okay. <laughs> they put the two ministries together, yes. their conservative government. So traditionally, water was part of agriculture, like 50 years ago, everywhere in the world. And then 20 years ago, they started to move water from agriculture to the environment, which the agricultural lobby did not like at all, right? 
but the environmentalists liked it. And so in some countries it's combined. It, there's a friction, a tension, a tension because they're competing interests. Okay, and as I was saying, the, the reason why we have a water governance, like at the, mini, at the federal level, at the state level, municipal level, is to, to organize and coordinate this interest. So it, we don't have chaos and people shooting each other, but we have a coordination of the competing interests. Okay? And, and so that's a good thing, and really this has always been the case to some level, even in ancient Egypt, there was some governance of water, of course. Um, and um, now in water management, there is now a, a new stream, you know, a new idea that's coming in, and it's called participation. Participation. Can anybody, would anybody like to comment what participation means? Where's the micro? Who would like to comment what participation in water management means? I don't know if it's right, but I think that it's uh, people collaboration to make a decision about what will be about water. But I'm not. Yes. I yeah. don't know if it's that's right. exactly. That's exactly how I understand it. Exactly. So traditionally, there was a government with some water governance, for example, in river basin authorities or part of the ministries at the at federal, state, municipal levels, top down. So it was top up, if you had a democracy, you voted, you elected the government, but if you had a, a, a monarchy, you did not elect your monarch or a dictator. And then top down, the government was planning water management, water projects, water resources projects, like building a dam, and that was it. And there was a legal framework to support that, because in a, in a, in a, in a modern country, Everything we do needs to do within, should be within the legal framework, ideally, right? It's not always the case, but ideally, if you decide to build a dam, this must be within the legal framework of that country or that region, okay? So the traditional approach was water governance, top down. A minister or somebody decided, I want a dam. Be can, he or she can be assisted by experts, of course, to suggest it, but then the decision is top down. And then, top down, then the, the, the experts or engineers in their ministry or the regional, the, the regional ministry, they plan this dam or ask consulting engineers to plan it, and then there's this procedure, and then they build the dam. That's it. And the local people may like it or not, but they get a dam, right? Or they get a canal, or water withdrawal, or, or a change in the, in the land use, you know, deforestation. That's the traditional system. And like some 20 to 30 years ago, there is a general trend, world with most countries of the world, uh, towards participation. And the idea is we also, not only top down, but some element of bottom up, the, the local stakeholders and local citizens are asked for their opinion, okay? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's good for the citizens, but maybe not good for the government, right? Because it, so I think it's a good thing because it's democratic. But on the other hand, it slows down the process. A, a classical case is the case of the Great Lakes, like Great Lakes be, between Canada and, and, and the US, there has been a, a long project or process of participation and how to manage the water level of the Great Lakes. You think it's a simple thing. How do we, we can, they can manage the water level depending on opening or closing their, the gates. It has been going on for 10 years or 15 years and people just don't agree. It's a mess, it's a complete mess because they all have competing interests. And if you allow people, if you allow the hydropower companies to have a say in the decision, they will oppose very fiercely what the people living at the, at the lake. They say, don't change the water level. I want to have my jetty and my boat. It should not change the water level. And the hydropower people say, if I can't change the water level, how can I produce energy? I can't produce the same energy the entire day. I want to produce more when I get more for my, for my energy. And fisheries and everybody, they have to say. So it becomes messy. But still, at the end of the day, participation is still a good thing. 
Okay? 5.1, one of the roles of sociohydrological models is to facilitate the discussion process in participative projects. So for the Great Lakes, for example, if you have a sociohydrological model, you can use it in a setting like here. We have like 50 people in the room. And the hydropower people and the fisheries, they have all a different interest, obviously. And let's say we implement the water levels, not only hydraulically, but also socially. You have this kind of model. Well, this kind of model would actually be very suitable for this kind of process. And then you ask the group, you're, you're the moderator, and, and ask the group, uh, good idea, let's uh, keep the water level fixed as the, the people living at the, 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 at the lake would like to have. Let's see what happens. And then you run the model with certain uh, conditions, and then you see how happy the, stake the various stakeholders are, the farmers and the fisheries. Uh, ah, it's very bad for the others. Then they realize they're not the only stakeholder, and there's actually a connection. There's a physical connection because of the hydraulics, but there's also a social connection. So you can use this um, model as an instrument to moderate a discussion process. And this usually works quite well, because most people are not stupid, and they are good willing, but they have their interests. It's, so this is, an, I think, it's one of the most important applications for this kind of models, yeah, facilitating discussion process. 5.1. Then let's go move on to 5. Any comments on that or questions? Joining to, to the idea of the observatory as a way of a moderator or a neutral field to, to, uh, res to solve the conflicts for different stakeholders. So we appreciate that. Okay, 5.1. Now, 5.2, this relates to the scenarios we have been what generally discussing, discussing in engineering. Right? In engineering, you say, you two trains on the bridge, so I need to make it stronger than for one train of the bridge, right? This is the usual scenario in, in engineering. Um, in in socio-hydrology, because socio is involved, we coined the term possibility space. So rather than making a prediction of what is happening in 50 years of how many shops there are in downtown Sean Carlos, we say, if we make this decision, there are possible traces how the future may evol evolve. So we don't know how it evolves, but there are a number of possibilities how the future can evolve. No shops at all, or you can, you can drive people to suicide. There are sociological models about suicide. Yeah? Bad thing. things, these things happen. So um, you, you can simulate possible traces of the future and again, use them as the basis for decision making. These are not predictions. These are possible futures, okay? Which is slightly different from the usual scenario. Um, figure 12. Is, do we have figure 12? What is this? Ah, this is the result of the, of the, um, of the uh, flat socio-hydrological model of uh, Alberto Viglione and Giuliano di Baltasari. So what they did on the horizontal axis is time for each of these panels. On the vertical axis is wealth, so simulations of this model over hundreds of years. And uh, so the higher points are better and the community is wealthier. And they did lots of simulations, randomized, and the darker there is, the more traces you have in the future. And these little boxes, the different terms of the model parameters for the socio component of the community. And uh, so uh, the, the top ones are people, uh, let me remember, the, the columns, right, starts from an elephant to a cicada. Okay, and uh, this is about uh, memory, memory. So there's a memory parameter in the model, 
And this group of people have a memory like an elephant, which means a long or a short uh, memory. Long. I'm not sure whether it's true, but this is what people say. Elephants have a long memory. So if you have a long memory, this is the kind of outcome you can expect. And you see, it's not very good, actually. It goes down. They go bankrupt. The long memory, too long memory is not so good. And um, this is a short memory. A cicada, you know what a cicada is? Like a grasshopper, right? Grasshopper. 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 Uh, this is the idea of Alberto Viglione, he's Italian, so insist, he insisted on Cicada, right? So, okay, I can understand that. So she, that's, he or she, Cicada, forgets very quickly, right? Like in the Greek fables, forgets very quickly, and then we get the right thing, right? On the horizontal axis, we have um, risk-taking attitudes. The risk-taking attitudes. So the people who take a lot of risks uh, at the bottom, lion, and those who do not take a risk, frightened people, are the rabbits at the bottom. So you have the combination of memory and risk-taking attitude. So each panel, little box, is a combination of these two parameters. And then you can say, well, my community is somewhere here, and uh, so if I have this combination, then the future looks very good. Steep increase in the, in the budget of, of the community. But if, it looks, if the combination is different, like that, then it doesn't look so very good. Okay, so that's the idea, that you not only look at the possibility space in terms of the physics, the hydrology, the technology, but also in terms of the people behavior, depending what kind of people you have in the, in, in the system, because they will control to a large degree, what's going to happen in the sociological context. Okay, possibility space. The term is possibility space, which is like a meter perspective that goes beyond the usual scenarios. Questions? Every dot there are time dependent from the other dot or not? Or not, they are only random. Okay. Yes, uh, this graph has been produced by running this kind of model many times with diff so many times where each dot is a function of the previous dot because it's a dynamic model, but 10,000 times in parallel with different, with different time sequences of rainfall. Different time sequences, same distribution of the rainfall but with different time sequences, which is also interesting which is tells us what the, or, or the floods, time sequences of flood, whether two floods occur in, immediately each, after each other or whether they occur at a larger distance in time makes a difference. So this is the, the uncertainty or, or the, the spread, which is only introduced in this case by the time sequence of the floods. It's quite interesting. I, I mentioned this yesterday because in engineering we never ever take into account the time sequence of floods. Never. We just look at the probability of a flood discharge. Not when it occurs for these design problems. Anyway, so possibility space. Okay, shall we move on? Then, uh, then uh, five, three, I believe. Ah. Now this is more about science than, than water management, but with implications for water management. Generally, in water resources management, it, this is an applied thing. So the, it's case study based. So you have a local problem, and then you have the hydrologists and managers and maybe, maybe social scientists come in making a case study, a narrative of what's going on, also politicians. Politicians like narratives, something also that narratives are something you can communicate very well. A narrative sticks in people's minds. It's much easier to remember a story than seven individual points. Right? Try to remember seven points, what you have to take to, for the weekend at the beach. Seven, seven points is really quite hard to remember. If you just pack these seven things into a story, you will see that it's very easy to remember seven things. Okay? So it's, 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 a, it, mem, it's called memnotic technique. Memnotic technique, something to remember. It's a story. Okay? So our water management is usually based on stories in a, in a local context. And very rarely, 
do people look at other places? So they manage their floods in San, pa at San Carlos and not really interested in the water management or flood problems in other, in other cities. Why would they? It's not their responsibility, so why would they look at other places? And in science, of course, in physics or in engineering, we always do that. The purpose of science, what's the purpose of science? Okay, you would like to comment on the purpose of science. And our, of, but the purpose of life, we can talk later over the beer. But purpose of science, how, what, how would you define? I, I have more, my idea about that, but I would like to hear your idea. What is the purpose, of, why are we doing science? What, what is the goal, the, cha the, the aim of science? What do we want to achieve in science? Very good. Maybe make the life of the people better. Make the life of the people better, yes. This is, I think, is a very valid applied goal of science. Okay. I think there's also another goal, that is, I think this is a very valid answer. There's an, another less applied goal. Uh, uh, make the world a better place, not, uh, not only for people, but for the environment, okay. for economy. It's also an applied goal, also very valid. When people first found uh, that the Earth is not the center of the universe, or, but like the sun, was it with the purpose to make the world a better place? Did it help to make the world a better place? Very indirectly, right? <laughs> not really. Right? When Newton found his law of gravitation, you know, mass is acceleration times force, did so, not directly make the world a better place. To understand how things work? To understand how things work, and I, I would like to add to that, yes, understand how things work in a consistent and organized way. So if I understand how you work individually, it has elements of science, but it's more empirical. Uh, science is more about how do people generally work, universally. To find, uh, my definition is, the purpose of science is to find order in the disorder. It looks like a mess here, but then if we look carefully, there's a lot of similarities. There can be laws that they apply everywhere. To find order in the disorder is my definition, of theoretical definition, and the applied one also applies, of course, right? Very good, also yours. Find order in the disorder. Now, water management does not pursue this goal of finding order in the disorder in a universal sense. It certainly makes, helps it, the applied goal it, it does achieve to make the world a better place locally, yeah, there's no question, but not the more generic goal of science. Now, sociohydrology has this ambition to have a more universal understanding of the processes. So this model should not only apply to the city center of San Carlos, but also to other places. We want to find relationships that are not only case specific, but generic. And this may help a lot, because if you go to a new city, water managers, they always start from scratch, right? They do the questionnaires, always from scratch. But if you know something that is universal, like Newton's law, that's very useful. You go to a place, you've never been there before, like Brazil. I came to Brazil, I know in Brazil, Newton's laws works. Even yeah, I mean, you understand my point? So even though I've never been here before, I know it works. And that's super useful. That's super, super useful. And sociohydrology has this ambition. Well, I'm not saying this is like Newton's law, but you understand my drift. Yeah? We have this ambition to be more universally applicable than the usual water management practice. Okay? Good. And then uh, and that's it. Then I can have, can we go further down? Uh, we can skip this. The future of sociohydrology challenges and opportunities, opportunities, and we've listed here a couple of questions. One, two, three, four, uh, other timescale interactions, etc. So if anybody's looking for a PhD <laughs> with Mario, <laughs> here are potential questions for PhD studies, right? And they're qu um, I'll read the first one, right? And you can read the others. Are there timescale interactions that are typical 
of human water system behavior. Can slow and fast processes of the environment, technology, economics, and institutions be identified? What are the generic principles underlying the occurrence of emergent behavior in such systems? What is the role of path dependence and lock-ins? Okay, there are lots of questions for a PhD thesis, maybe more than one. But you can see this is generic. This is not what is the water level in Champ Carlos on the 2nd of April next year, right? It's more generic. And, well, you can read more of those, but this is all of the, along the lines what we've been discussing the past three days. For you to be interested or somebody else, who would like to pursue this, this topic of sociohydrology. Okay, and that's it. I think I would like to stop, unless there are questions on that. But maybe we can have some more discussion. Last questions uh, about from the, from the academia, from the students, some feedback. Maybe from the other campuses? Yes, from the other campuses. Uh, uh, Felipe. I'm asking him. Ah, okay. So, uh, only to, to reinforce your uh, own definition about science, my own definition about science is, is very, very related to evolution. Mm -hmm. Through science, we can achieve a better level of evolution. Without science, perhaps we are not going in, in, a, in a good direction. So it's a very good uh, question about co-evolution. Right? Yes, yes. Questions? This is Okay, so if we had no more questions, because this is a very new, well, yesterday we built up the first participatory socio-hydrological model in Brazilian ground. And this is that's a very high power because it was in a participatory way for, for, for myself. It's an, a historic day, really, I appreciate very much. Um, and of course, second, we have a new concept, we, new levels of understanding. Uh, also from your lecture, perhaps one question is if you can share with us our PDF or something like that, uh, your presentation, your lecture on, on Wednesday. Uh, you have, uh, because I think that this presentation can reinforce some synthesis about the difference between integrated water resource management and socio-hydrology. One of them was, for me, was very uh, important. Um, and of course, the third is related to the follow-up. The follow-up, because here we have PhD candidates, Master of Science candidates, and also some of them go into postdocs. And of course, uh, we put the, the seed uh, to be harvested in the next months, uh, at, uh, in November, late November this year, we have the Brazilian Water Resources Symposium, and we are still in the, uh, uh, the deadline is in the next week, and all of them, par partially, mostly, are preparing manuscripts. Um, most of them also related to socio-hydrological aspects uh, of memory or even questioning or even in education. Uh, so uh, I think that's uh, we need time uh, and reflection. So today in the afternoon after the lunch, we are still here uh, working, discussing. Uh, uh, even in the evening, uh, we have some uh, 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 flower celebration close to the campus. Uh, but now I think that we need to create a channel for the follow-up. So the idea is with Felipe, Susana, Alfredo, Carlos, and Yana uh, to create an email uh, that's in this email we can maintain the forum alive about questions, about help, or about networking. Because some questions you have here perhaps are the same questions they have in Europe or even in China or in the United States. And up to now, we are still walking slowly to know more people working with socio-hydrology with the same questions. Yeah? And this is very interesting. Right? When I, I meet people working in the same field or with the same questions, this is a celebration. 
And I think that we need to create this follow-up email forum or the like, okay? So we can work in, in this direction with Felipe and the other professors from Pernambuco and Paraiba. Do you agree with that? Okay? Do you have any any op they have questions? Okay, uh, question. Mr. Alfredo just asked uh, sociological models must be simple enough to be understood by the stakeholders. And is this a concern of the modelers? Okay. Um, the question now is, should there are social hydrological models, when we use them to facilitate consensus in water management problems between stakeholders, should they be simple enough to be understood by the stakeholders? Uh, and my answer to that is, it's a real advantage if this is the case. If, they un if stakeholders understand, if we change one thing, it will change another thing, it will be much easier to have trust in the model. If the stakeholders do not understand it and just have to take the results at face values, it's also possible, but it's more difficult. So my preference is for the stakeholders to understand how the model works. So that's why the simpler models have advantages over system of system models. Just to, for, for context, uh, I've been a lot of work on climate change and water resources in Austria and, and Europe. And uh, in, in Bavaria, which is a state north of Austria, very close to Austria, the person responsible for climate change and water management, he was retiring. So he was retired and had his retirement party, and he asked me, he asked, saying me, now, for the past 15 years, we've contracted many climate change studies on water resources. I have all the results I, can, I, I want. Increasing floods, decreasing floods, drought, everything. I, I, because different studies give different results. What shall I do with these results? Right, and this is an example. These are all black box projects. They get a result, more floods, more, smaller floods. What can I do with this? Shall I trust it or not? And this is a bit of a problem. And the same applies to stakeholders. If they understand how this model works, they just have much more trust in the results in the model than if they do not understand it. I think this was a very good question. In the second point, or the first point you, you presented before in the paper, uh, I think that the social hydrology uh, could moderate the understanding among stakeholders. So. I think that's, the, in my view, as a, a beginner, eh, we need to address social hydrology as a, as a moderation field, and not only from the modeling point of view. That's the point, because people, when you, 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 you arrive to the, to the class or to their meeting, say, okay, they are coming, the, they are the modelers, they are the theoretical people. Eh? So I think that's, the way we pre introduce ourselves to the stakeholders should be more in terms of the praxis, more in terms of solving the problem, and of course, creating a communication channel to moderate the conflicts, but not only from the point of view of modeling. Uh, modeling, as you really mentioned, is a very clean and elegant way or a tool to moderate and solve the solutions. But that is very important. Uh, well, I, 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 I get the point, we really appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, this is not final words. This is in a an, an pit stop word. This is in a pit stop, we have several pit stop. So, um, on behalf of the group of Federal University of Pernambuco, Federal University of Campina Grande, and two different states in Northeast Brazil, and uh, University of Sao Paulo in Sao Paulo State, we are very, very proud to receive you in these very exciting and fruitful days, in a very uh, a fruitful uh, uh, weather, uh, in April month 2018, uh, 19, sorry. Um, really, I um, learned a lot 
but I have the, f the feeling that I need to, uh, uh, to learn more and more with the student, with my colleagues. So uh, we would like to say you thank you very much for your, you, for your coming and please keep in touch with this whole audience. And we have uh, uh, Lisette and Cesar Ailton. Uh, uh, they are going to, uh, on behalf of the others, uh, uh, of all the students, I, I am a student also, uh, to give you a, a, a simple remembering. That's for you, uh, a gift. Here, here, here. <laughs> It's a gift for you, and to thank your time, your knowledge, because it was so important for us. Uh, I learned a lot. I think that everybody here learned a lot. And we are really happy to have you here and, and, and work with you maybe in the future. We, ha we have all this hope, I think, to work with you in the future. So thank you. We select the most far away people coming from the Amazon River Basin ah. from Colombia, uh, uh, country. Uh, yeah, the, the more distant. More distant. Most distant. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been a fantastic group to work with. I really enjoyed the past days. It was really very nice for me. A fantastic experience I will not forget. But I would like, I'm curious what is in there. So I, <laughs> so I, I will open that. Because it does say what it is, but I don't understand it. <laughs> What is it? Ah. Uh, it's a soccer, soccer so, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, então nós estamos fechando esse módulo 1 oficialmente das da escola avançada de estudos da CAPES, de Água e Sociedade em Mudança, com o professor Gunther Blush, como principal visitante. E semana que vem, nós voltamos com o módulo 2, com visitante da Universidade de Oxford, no Reino Unido, Oxford University, aqui, professor Nick Hankins, que já está a programação disponível para vocês também. E também queremos que tanto o pessoal de Campina Grande, como de, do Recife, participem. Todos receberam. A todos e todas, muito obrigado. A nosso cordial agradecimento a Júnior, Marcelo Tadeu, a todos e Chisky pela pelo apoio. Principalmente a nosso manager, nosso gerente desse módulo 1, Felipe. Um aplauso também. E para o Cetisky, tá bom? Muito obrigado. Sem, sem a colaboração de vocês, isso aqui não seria possível. Muito obrigado. Bom final de semana a todos e a todas. E até a próxima semana. Muito obrigado.